time to get this show on the road. Welcome to Redfin Symposium on Race and Real Estate. I'm Glenn Kelman, Redfin CEO. We've got an action-packed agenda for you today. We're going to be talking to some real estate agents who work at Redfin to give a perspective on what it's like to be an agent of color, to work with customers of color. We've also got a former FBI agent talking about race and real estate. He is a Redfin customer. Is this you? Yes. Carlos, welcome. <laughs> Sorry, you caught me by surprise. Um, the reason we wanted to talk about this subject today is just because we have this holy obligation as real estate brokers to make sure that we provide fair access to housing. It's been 50 years since the passage of the Fair Housing Act, and still we have American cities that are deeply segregated by race and class. And sometimes that's because people don't have enough money to buy houses, but too often it's because the folks who have money to buy a house still can't get great service from a real estate agent. And I'm sure that's happened at traditional brokerages and also at Redfin as a brokerage where we've judged someone based on the color of his or her skin or on his military service or whether that person is gay or straight instead of just providing great customer service and understanding the different situations of different types of customers. So we treat this first and foremost as a training event for Redfin agents to make sure that we always provide fierce advocacy for every single one of our customers, regardless of that person's ethnicity or race or background. And so we're going to have a great conversation with Professor Elizabeth Corver Glenn, who did this amazing research on what happened in Houston with different agents and different types of customers trying to buy homes. Then we're going to have the agent panel. But first, I wanted to bring up my partner in crime, Denisha Brazel. Hi, everyone. So the master of ceremonies, do you want to lay out the order of events sure, here? Sure. So first we'll start off with, uh, as Glenn mentioned, uh, research that Dr. Um, Professor Clover, well, She's a doctor say that too. again. <laughs> say that credit. three times fast. <laughs> Professor Clover Glenn, um, with Glenn. And uh, next then we'll have some discussion between some of the agents that we have here based in uh, at our Seattle office. And we'll take a short break and then we'll come back and then we'll have a discussion with Carlos and his agent, Ellen. And um, we will have an opportunity later on for the audience to be able to participate in the Q&A and that will come later on. So that's about it. Let's get this show on the okay. road. Professor, you ready to come up and talk? Yes. Here we go. So please give a warm round of applause for Elizabeth Corver Glenn. How you doing? Doing great. Thank you for having me here. Oh, we're excited to have you. So the history here is that I was in an Alaskan yurt when I read your research. I was on Twitter <laughs> and I got this PDF emailed from you once I saw the tweet. And I read the whole research and it was this amazing moment because at first I thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe the industry hasn't served our customers better. And then I thought, oh my gosh, maybe one of the agents she studied is a Redfin agent. <laughs> you shouldn't tell us which, but uh, you followed 10 real estate agents for about a year in Houston. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us about your research? Sure. So um, just to give you some context of wh why Houston. Uh, Houston was a perfect place to do the research that I wanted to do because uh, it has several characteristics that would uh, indicate or at least suggest that segregation would be lower. So uh, Houston has um, a very diverse population. It's the most ethnically diverse metropolitan area in the U.S. now. It's sur surpassed New York. Um, it has no zoning. It's the only major city in the U.S. with no zoning laws. So they're, um, in part because of that, uh, housing is affordable. And so all of these kind of conditions would seem to suggest that segregation is lower in, in Houston, but actually segregation in Houston is, is still pretty high. Um, and over the last 20 years, from 1990 to 2010 actually, uh, Hispanic white segregation increased in Houston. So I thought, I need to, I need to understand what's going on here. So uh, I started shadowing these real estate agents. I, well, before that I approached them, asked them if they wanted to, uh, wanted uh -huh. to participate in my study, uh, and they graciously agreed. And uh, at the same time that I was following them around their, their daily work, I was also attending open houses on my own. I attended several dozen open houses. Um, and through those open houses and other events like luncheons and so on, I observed or encountered 56 additional real estate ag agents. And then I also conducted 37 in-depth interviews with a, a racially diverse sample of real estate agents as well. Holy cow. 
Did you tell these agents the premise of your research? Did they know you were studying racial attitudes and customer service? Yes, I told them broadly speaking that, that my study was about the housing market and racial or ethnic identity. And the question I asked you when we were preparing for this was how you got them to get their guard down. Like if you told me you were studying my racial attitudes, I would definitely be on my best behavior. <laughs> And yet some of the findings in the study were shocking to read, where you found agents who were really just very different in their approach to different types of customers. How did you get so comfortable with the agents you were studying? It's a great question. Uh, I think part of it was that um, as part of participating in my study, the, agent, the real estate agents um, knew that they would, their identity would be protected. So um, they, I would never use their real names or other identifying information. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, and I tried as best as I could to convince them that this was not only going to help me in terms of like my research and my career, but also could have a broader impact on the industry more broadly. And so uh, hopefully those two things working together helped. Uh, a third component I think was that um, agents in many cases didn't view the, their attitudes or, or the stereotypes that they used as problematic. Um, and didn't see the connection between uh, some of their kind of individual behaviors and then wider spread patterns of inequality. Got it. And maybe we should just talk about what you saw. Sure. So um, uh, one of the first things that I would say is that as you observed, um, their agents are regularly um, finding their business and, and doing business through their networks. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as I talk about in my study, this is how agents view their value, consumers view agents' value in terms of the connections that they have, um, both to other professionals and to, to other consumers. Uh, but as I point out in my study, the, these, um, these networks are not race neutral. So white real estate agents had predominantly, in some cases almost exclusively, uh, white networks. So they're working mm -hmm. almost totally with other white professionals and, and white consumers, whereas agents of color had much more uh, racially diverse sets of clients and other kind of um, professional contacts as well. And so, uh, so yes, so doing, doing business through, through some of these networks, uh, I think was, was one of the main things that I found was happening. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was one of the first findings. And reading those findings, I felt proud of being a real estate brokerage. I felt proud of our real estate agents because the first result was that your real estate agent really makes a difference, not only in the service that he or she delivers on her own, but also because of her relationships with a builder who will fix a problem with a house even after a closing, because of her relationship with the lender who can get you the money when no one else can, because of her relationship with a stager who can make your house look like a million bucks when it's really worth 800,000. So that part, in so many ways, was such a vindication for what we do. But maybe you could talk about how that also worked against diversifying a neighborhood, where you have an agent with that amazing network, but then that agent is very confined in terms of the customers he or she works with. How did that work? Sure. So um, I think there are a couple of different things to say here. One is that. Um, the, because agents' networks were racially segregated, uh, that meant that there were qualitatively distinct opportunities for kind of accessing homes. Uh, one of the main kind of mechanisms for this that I found in my study was pocket listings. Um, so I found that, that white agents routinely would engage pocket listings um, with their clients, and agents of color almost never did. Uh, and of course, what that meant was that because uh, white agents had predominantly white clients, um, and, and prospective buyers of color were underrepresented in their networks. That means that prospective buyers of color were disproportionately excluded from accessing uh, these, these pocket listed homes, uh, which of course has, has serious implications in terms of uh, ongoing neighborhood segregation as well. And when these agents pocketed the listings, were they conscious? I, knew th I know that they're thinking about creating a competitive advantage for themselves and also creating a competitive advantage for their clients, but do you think they understood the social implications? I think r in rare cases they understood the social implications, or at least were, um, were willing to talk about them. Uh, I think I had two agents that, that mentioned maybe there were some fair housing implications um, from, of pocket listings, uh, but otherwise there was, um, there was not a discussion really more broadly among my agents of the social implications. And can you talk about 
how agents of color felt about that. If you're trying to represent a buyer and that buyer is concerned that you're not the best advocate for her in an exclusive neighborhood, how did that affect those agents and their ability to build their business? So the first thing I would say is that because uh, because white agents tended to kind of control white consumer business, that meant that agents of color were rarely able to access uh, white consumers, and so um, it was it was not something that they really talked about very much because they rarely had uh, white clients, uh, and those that did have white clients had white clients who expressed more willingness, perhaps, to move into um, neighborhoods of color. Got it. I want to talk to you about the conflation of class and race, because I think the argument that I most often hear when this discussion is broached is about having different levels of service for customers who have more or less money. In every kind of business, people with more money get more service. We shouldn't be surprised by that in a capitalist society. And yet, you were able to find some examples that pulled that apart, where even when there was a person of color who did have plenty of money, that customer wasn't credible with the agent. The agent found subtle ways to say, well, you're not qualified for a loan, or you need to learn more about the process. Can you tell us about how you pulled that apart? Sure. So um, I, I think the, the first part of the argument that kind of exists out more broadly in the world, that, uh, that mm -hmm. people of color receive the same treatment as uh, white individuals if they have the same amount of money. Um, I think that there's a lot of evidence, both mine and my others, that uh, debunks this argument um, pretty soundly. Um, so in terms of both quantitative and qualitative uh, evidence, uh, consumers of color do not receive the same levels of service as white consumers. Um, if you look at housing audit studies, and I'm not sure um, if how much training or, or, or whatever your, your agents have with housing audit studies, but um, housing audit studies, for those that may be watching, um, are studies that pair prospective buyers who share every characteristic except race. Uh, so, for example, they pair a black buyer and a white buyer that have the same income, the same credit score, same education, and so on, and they each approach the same real estate agent, ask for information about available homes, and uh, then record what information, if any, that real estate agent gives them. And uh, these studies uh, show that uh, Asian, in general, Asian, uh, Black, and Latinx um, buyers of color are told about and shown uh, systematically fewer homes uh, than white individuals, and even though these individuals are all uh, equally financially qualified. Um, I and uh, others have found ways that this happens, so getting to some examples. So for example, in, in my research, um, wealthy buyers of color were not treated the same as, as white uh, buyers. Uh, one white real estate agent that I interviewed told me that her networks were predominantly white, but she did have a handful of wealthy black clients. And she described these wealthy black cl clients as, quote, a pain to work with. Mm -hmm. um, another... Um, Why do you think she said that? Just because she didn't have the same cultural background, because she was racist, because... Uh, they were it's hard. It's hard for me as a as, it's hard for me as a social scientist to speculate why um, why mm -hmm. someone might uh, express an attitude like that. My my, my guess is that um, she had some deeply held stereotypes about um, mm -hmm. black consumers that even when there was evidence to their ability to purchase homes were not countered, um, but. Again, I'm not a. I'm, I'm not I didn't in the mean business to put you of spe speculation. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, but my my main concern in this in this study was was like looking at the how, like what what was going on and how was this all happening. I can't I can't really speak to the why, so I have to I have to give you that bracketed, um, I guess kind of take on it. But other examples included. Uh, a Latina agent who worked with a middle-class Latina buyer. Um, there was a white listing agent uh, who kept insisting that, quote, by the sound of her name, she wouldn't be able to purchase the home, even though she was middle-class, pre-qualified, and so on. Um, and then an another black agent um, brought one of her wealthy black clients to, to view a newly built home. They had scheduled the appointment in advance, and so on. And uh, the white listing agent wouldn't let them in to view the home. Um, so did, there, there are many examples. What did the listing agent say? What was that person's rationale? Uh, they didn't say anything. They closed the and locked the door. And the black and agent reported. Mm -hmm. 
and the black agent reported this behavior, but the, um, but the white agent was still working there at the brokerage as of last check. Um, wow. So that's, those are some examples. Um, and then in terms of the, the other part of, of the question that you asked, in terms of um, wealthier individuals getting better service because they're paying more for it, I think this is a really important question. And I, uh, I think that my research and others can point to this or can address this in a couple of ways. Um, the first is that in my study, it wasn't just wealthier individuals that were getting better service. It was white individuals whom agents assumed were wealthier or who had more income who were also getting better service regardless of their actual levels of income. And so I think that that's important to, to point out. Like, yes, we live in a capitalist society, but it's not just about money. It's about assumptions around money. Um, and so that's, that's one thing that I would say. And that question was a setup for you to provide that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I knew Great. that was the finding of the study, having read it. Right. I wanted to talk just about one anecdote because for me it was the emotional center mm -hmm. of the research. And by the way, if you haven't read the research, uh, it really is more engaging and compelling than most academic research that you will read. Uh, I have a copy of it if anyone here at Redfin wants to read it. Uh, Professor Glenn, uh, Corver Glenn, excuse me, has been really gracious about sharing it with others who contact her. It's amazing. But with that as the prelude, um, here is what you heard one agent talk about. Mm -hmm. So the agent was talking about serving uh, people of color, and I, I think specifically African Americans. You have to do 15% more work for houses that are less expensive. The people over there aren't qualified. Their houses haven't been maintained. This lady called not too long ago and wanted to look at house at a house in Third Ward, which is a predominantly black Houston neighborhood. She said she had a good job and everything. I asked her if she was pre-qualified, she said no, and I explained that she needed to talk to a lender to find out what she would be pre-qualified for, and that I would send her a list of lenders, and then she got all defensive. I mean, I'll show her the house because it could result in a sale, but I know she's not qualified, and it's not because of race. It's because she doesn't know anything about the process, doesn't know about property taxes, and so on. And so first of all, hearing him talk about how she got all defensive for no apparent reason, I could easily imagine why she was getting upset. Mm -hmm. uh, it must get tiring mm -hmm. to have someone question your ability to buy a home when you just explained you have a good job. Mm -hmm. What was it like when he told you that story? First of all, as an academic, did you just write it down? Or did you talk to him about it? Yeah, so uh, as an academic, <laughs> Uh, I wrote it down, and uh, part, of, part of the goal when I'm doing research as a participant observer is to record in as much detail as possible what I observe in the field, and to, I know that I, I am there, and so I'm influencing things somehow, but to interfere as little as possible in what's going on. And so um, I, uh, I had actually asked him a question prior to, to that particular quote that you read um, about uh, why it seemed that, uh, that agents weren't farming uh, in, in neighborhoods of color, and uh, that was his response. And, uh, and so I, 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 I asked him the question that led to that, and uh, I didn't um, push back. I just recorded what he said and um, used it to help fuel f future questions in the field as well. And did he feel mixed about that decision, or did he feel absolutely confident about it? In what he said? Oh, he was very confident. Yes. Mm -hmm. He was not Understood. conflicted at all. So I wanted to talk to you about what to do about it. Clearly, we're having this event just to make sure that we're thoughtful as real estate agents about how we treat every single person we serve. Because I can easily imagine a Redfin agent talking to someone, having concerns about that person being able to afford a home, and recommending that they talk to a lender first. Uh, part of being a real estate agent is deciding where to spend your time. But because those decisions are so subjective and because we all have our own implicit biases that we grow up and don't even recognize, I wonder if you have a set of recommendations. If you could take those agents you studied mm -hmm. and talk to them for just 15 minutes at the end of the study and say, listen, Here's a few things that could make Houston a lot better over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. What would you say? 
So uh, the first thing that I would, would offer is, is a little bit of context, and that is um, to, to suggest and to, to argue, really, that when agents are providing different levels of service uh, to different individuals, they're not just affecting those individuals. They're affecting the neighborhoods in which those individuals are located. So say, for example, um, an agent is working really hard on behalf of, of her clients and um, brings many, many uh, offers to the table. The home ends up selling for uh, higher than the asking price. Of course, that benefits the individual home seller. But it also brings benefits to that neighborhood because that home becomes a comparable sale that influences the direction of home values in the area as well. On the other, on, like, on the other hand, uh, if the agents are providing like, different kinds of service, lower quality service to other individuals that not only affects those home sellers, it affects the neighborhoods in which they're embedded. And so I think that the real estate brokerage industry does have this obligation to uh, bring to the best of its ability equal service to all consumers uh, because of these implications. It's not just individuals that, that, that brokers are assisting. It's, it's shaping entire land, neighborhoods and landscapes of cities. And so I, that's, that's by way of context, like where my recommendations are coming from. Um, in terms of concrete recommendations, I, I would urge any brokerage to implement multiple um, kinds of different strategies simultaneously because I think uh, inequality is so entrenched that any simple solution is not going to work on its own. Mm -hmm. Um, so as a cohesive aim of um, affirming equal housing opportunity, I would first of all train and recruit, um, recruit and then train, um, order matters, recruit and then train a racially uh, diverse uh, cohorts of real estate agents. And then I would encourage them to work in mixed race pairs. So for example, in hosting open houses or um, doing client appreciation events or generating leads, um, to, to work together in mixed race pairs as, as much as, as possible. And this, the, the aim here would really be to, um, to kind of break down some of the, the segregated network effects that I was observing um, in, in the field work that I was doing. Um, second, I would also train agents uh, with concrete scenarios of what they might encounter in, in their work. Uh, so not just examples of explicit racial prejudice, which I certainly encountered in, in, my, in my research, but also examples of what I would call racial coding or um, using words that kind of substitute for race and no one says an actual racial category, but everyone else knows what is meant. Um, Can you give me examples? Oh, sure. So um, many times in my study when agents would call a neighborhood un unsafe or crime-ridden, they were referring exclusively to black or Latino neighborhoods. And everyone understood that that's what was meant. Um, when they referred to a neighborhood as a good neighborhood or a desirable, na neighborhood, desirable neighborhood, um, everyone understood that that meant it was a white neighborhood or it was becoming a white neighborhood. Um, so again, giving them these concrete scenarios, walking them through, like, how would you respond? How, what would you do if, you know, if your client said this or, or your customer did that? Um, and then I would also train, this is the third thing I would do, is I would actually equip agents with facts about homes and neighborhoods uh, so that there would be less of a temptation to rely on stereotypes and hearsay. Mm -hmm. So for example, consumer demand. Um, in real estate uh, economics, a common way of measuring uh, consumer demand is to look at the average number of days homes are on the market in the neighborhood and to look at the average percent of homes that take a price cut. Mm -hmm. So the higher, number of or the higher number of days homes are on the market, the higher percent of homes that take a price cut, the lower demand is, right? Okay, so in Houston, um, demand is actually higher in black and Latino neighborhoods. But the prevailing wisdom is that demand is higher in white neighborhoods. Um, and so again, this is, this is something, this is a, a simple kind of fact yeah. that, that agents should know um, so that there's less of a yeah. temptation to rely on stereotypes. Um, fourth, and I just have two more. A fourth recommendation that I have is, um, is that I would organize my brokerage under a flat fee uh, model of pay uh, because I would want to encourage agents to generate as many leads as possible and hopefully uh, eliminate the incentive that I think agents have to uh, rely on notions of, of consumer value um, in terms of like the percentage-based commission structure. I think, I think this, is, um, this is a problematic thing that should be a change. I'm going to ask you more about that. Oh, okay, great. Um, and, uh, and hopefully eliminate kind of the incentive that I think the agents have for using some of these stereotypes. 
Um, and then finally, I would, I would just not allow pocket listings whatsoever in my firm. I think they're very problematic uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that they limit competition for uh, home and potentially limit profit for homeowners. And then the second, as I mentioned earlier, is that they disproportionately exclude individuals that aren't represented in agents' networks. So I think together, um, implementing some of these strategies and others would, mm -hmm. um, I think, help position the real estate brokerage industry to truly provide equal service to, to every person um, seeking housing. I want to talk to you about your fourth recommendation because sure. some of the people in the audience can remember when Redfin paid agents the same amount of money for every single sale, and the only variable was how happy the customer was. And this proceeded from my ex-hippie Berkeley ideals. It did not work very well. And the problem was that we couldn't recruit agents in expensive areas. Mm -hmm. We found that the customers themselves mm -hmm. expected their agent to make more. They wanted to see that agent driving a certain kind of car with a certain kind of mm -hmm. handbag or valise. <laughs> it was a real challenge to deliver service to different types of neighborhoods without having different types of pay. And I found the most convincing argument to be the one from customers themselves mm. who were quite upset with these egalitarian notions when they wanted that agent to earn more for a million dollar house to make sure that they got the privileges that you're worried about. Mm -hmm. um, and I still don't know what to do about that, but I wondered what you would do in my shoes. So uh, I think it's, it's an interesting problem, and I, but I do think that it's, it's one that would, um, if, if I think brokerages work together, it would uh, actually uh, make a change. So I don't think a single brokerage alone can, can affect the kinds of uh, uh, egalitarian ideals that I'm kind of sharing here. Um, but I think that there's, there's a, mm -hmm. there are examples in other industries for um, how both expectations around pay and professional culture mm -hmm. work together to either reinforce prevailing norms or to change those norms. So for example, when I was doing my research, which uh, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but I, I not only study the real estate brokerage industry, I was also studying mortgage lending and appraising and, and so on as part of the broader project. An interesting contrast emerged between real estate agents and appraisers. And uh, real estate agents in my study were, um, as you observed, I think, in, in one of our conversations, were very committed, sometimes zealously committed to this percent-based uh, commission rate. In Houston, that's the going rate is 6%. Um, but appraisers worked under a flat fee model. And uh, some of them actually thought that um, getting paid a percentage of, of whatever the home's value or price was was actually unethical. Appraisers thought that they should only be paid the same amount for all of the homes that they were praised, regardless of the price point of the home. And, um, and so there was this like moral dimension for, it, uh, for them as well. And so I think uh, when we consider uh, like professional cultures and kind of pay structure, I think when we look at the intersection of those two things, we might see some solutions and for the brokerage industry more broadly as well. It would be much easier mm -hmm. if we could pay everyone the way uh, other brokerages did and have it be a flat fee. It's just so hard in a competitive market. And I'm not saying that we won't find a way to get there because we think all the time about the incentives we have and whether they're aligned not only with what each individual customer wants, but with what we want as a society. And it's just been a really difficult negotiation between those objectives. I have one more question, sure. mm -hmm. and then we'll see if the audience wants to ask anything. And it's about the website. Mm -hmm. So. We operate a website, and we also run a real estate brokerage. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that we've been wrestling with is how the internet can sometimes work in favor of a more equitable society instead of deepening divisions and mm -hmm. causing more partisan warfare. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations about that? Because we've prided ourselves on having black and white agents reviewed based on their performance, on having customers of any color being able to connect with any type of agent. Um, and we've hoped that that's limited some of the network effects that you're describing. But more recently, we've been battling about whether to publish school scores because the school scores themselves are a product of whether you have a rich neighborhood with rich kids 
um, or not. Mm -hmm. um, and we just wondered what your perspective was on the website. website. So uh, in theory, I think that um, the internet and internet technology is like mm -hmm. online sales and profiles and things like that can definitely boost the profiles of uh, agents of color. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that the internet alone can break very entrenched popular associations about neighborhoods and race. Um, and by that I mean, so in my study it was, um, uh, it was not just that, that white consumers were uh, referred to white agents, but they also wanted to work with white agents because they felt that white agents would understand their desires to avoid minority neighborhoods without actually having to say so. Um, and white agents on their part found creative ways to, to, to do this. So they would, for example, they would advise um, their clients to drive around neighborhoods after work hours or on the weekends so that they could get a feel for the neighborhood, i.e. see who was living there. Um, they um, expressed discomfort with the local public schools or they suggested the areas were unsafe. Um, and they believed that they were not breaking the law by doing this and they um, um, didn't, they actually believed that it was the way that they were going to make their money. Mm -hmm. So all this is to say that um, I think the internet technologies can, um, can actually be very productive, but I think that these internet technologies that Redfin and maybe some, some other brokerages are, are starting to get into is they will be most effective if they're paired with industry or brokerage specific incentives that prompt agents to uh, recruit clients of color and meaningful consequences or disincentives for agents who avoid prospective clients of color. So I think it has to be uh, t things working in tandem. And not just the internet alone can break these very entrenched, assum entrenched assumptions. Um, also industry and, and brokerages, I think, have, have an, um, uh, an obligation to, to really incentivize or de-incentivize agent behavior through implementing other strategies as well. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm an academic now where I should just be asking questions, but I have to weigh in as a CEO just to make one clear statement since mostly this is an event for our field organization. I've said this before to different groups, but if we ever found out that one of our agents was treating people of color differently and wasn't advocating as fiercely for that person as, as we would for a white client, we would ask you to leave. It's one of the only things where we wouldn't give you a second chance where that would just be the end of it because we have to feel that every customer who comes from our website or from your own network is going to be treated the same way, that there's going to be fierce advocacy uh, for that customer. But now I'm going to turn it over to the audience to see if there are any questions before we bring up uh, Roderick and James and Lori. Are there any questions? Can you speak into the microphone? Hi, I'm really grateful for your sharing your insights. Um, I work in a bank, and I'm curious to hear your perspective on any research you've had done on the role that uh, lending plays in reinforcing the racial and class segregation in America. Yes, there is a lot of research on mortgage lending inequality. Um, prior to uh, deregulate, do, um, deregulation of, uh, of the mortgage lending industry in the 90s, uh, the story was one of, um, of prospective borrowers of color essentially being locked out of, of mortgage loan opportunities systematically, regardless of income or credit score. Um, when the industry became uh, deregulated in, in the 90s um, and into the early 2000s, uh, a, a massive shift occurred. And what happened was that um, uh, subprime lenders and kind of boutique lenders that specialized in, in subprime loan products, because there was less regulation uh, of these um, companies, were able to go uh, and offer their, offer their products. And there's been a lot of research uh, recently that's shown that they actually disproportionately um, were targeting uh, neighborhoods and, and um, prospective borrowers of color for these subprime uh, loan products in the lead up to the housing crash. And so uh, what happened in the, in the housing crash and in the aftermath of the housing crash is that communities of color and of color who owned their homes disproportionately felt um, that crash. So disproportionately had, um, uh, were foreclosed upon, uh, disproportionate losses of wealth, and so on. Um, so there's been, there's been a couple of waves of how mortgage lending inequality works. 
Um, in my study, I did, uh, did study mortgage lending as well. And one thing that I found was that the same kinds of stereotypes that real estate agents were using um, emerged repeatedly in my interactions with mortgage lenders as well. And they can, they can access these stereotypes because on um, Form 1003, the, the kind of the required uh, mortgage loan application form, um, uh, applicants have to write their names and they have to, well, they don't have to, but they're um, urged to fill out their race, ethnicity, and sex information. And if they don't fill it out, then the lender will fill it out for them. And underwriters view all of that information. And they use um, uh, clients' names and their race, ethnicity uh, to make discretionary judgments about applicant risk. So there's, there's a lot going on in mortgage lending as well. We have time for one more question, if there is one. Why don't we do two, since you guys, you guys tied for first. Hi, thank you again for doing this. Um, I wanted to ask, did any of your research look at some racial um, discrimination between broker to broker? Um, we've had scenarios, I come from Chicago, where some of the scenarios I'm hearing about is if you're a broker of color working with a person or consumer of color and you're trying to buy a home in a neighborhood that is traditionally a white neighborhood, mm -hmm. that that um, selling broker is not cooperative, is asked mm -hmm. questions that violate fair housing, et cetera. Do you, did you, any of your research see that? Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't notice any patterns of broker to broker discrimination, but I did notice patterns of uh, other kinds of professional to professional discrimination. So, for example, um, uh, one of the Latino agents in my study uh, had a white architect who refused to work with him. Um, one appraiser had a white real estate agent approach him and uh, ask that he take uh, lower value comps so that the prospective black buyer would not be able to purchase the home because the contract would fall through. Um, and there were there are other examples like this, a, a professional to professional, but not necessarily broker to broker, although I can very well believe that that is happening as well. I think the hardest situation for us is when we feel that a listing agent or the seller isn't excited about an offer because it's coming from someone who hasn't traditionally lived in that neighborhood. And on one hand, you want to rock the boat and say, this is an outrage. And on the other hand, you still have a hope of putting the deal together. And so you really don't say anything. I think we sometimes feel hamstrung in those situations, and I'm sure that's been the case with other brokerages too, uh, where the last thing you want to do is upset the apple cart when you're that close to getting the deal done. Yeah, and I think that's actually, that, that feeling of being hamstrung is actually a really good signal that something about the process needs to change. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that pay attention to those, those feelings of helplessness because that's where the change comes. Hi, I'm Sarah Siddiqui. I'm actually with the National Association of Realtors. And I actually had a question about the awareness um, that you came across in your study of these brokers and agents and appraisers and how much did you feel that they were aware of what was going on and when it was brought to them, how they reacted. I asked because I've, I've used the research and focus groups and we get some agents who are very aware and some who aren't aware and some who don't want to recognize that it's going on. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were from the academic perspective. So you mean in terms of uh, brokers or agents being aware that discrimination is happening or? Or that it, they're even engaging in these unconscious biases. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so I would, I would definitely say that there seemed to be uh, a racial divide here as well. So agents of color, in part because of their own experiences and because they witnessed the struggles of, of their, um, their clients or customers, uh, were uh, definitely more aware of, uh, what, of these dynamics and the ways in which they had um, either been excluded or their clients had been excluded from accessing homes and opportunities. Uh, white agents more rarely uh, were aware of, of these dynamics. Um, and in fact, there seemed to be a, a kind of a, a broader agreement that if you don't say a, an explicit racial category, like if I don't say the word black, then it's okay. Or if I don't say the word Latino, then it's okay. Um, and that's not illegal, was the general sense of what was going on. Um, and uh, I, I would argue from, from, an, from an academic and also a policy perspective that uh, 
even if explicit racial categories aren't said, but everyone still knows what is meant, the effects are still going to be the same. There's still going to be the same racially unequal outcome. And, uh, and so this coding or these unconscious kind of biases that agents were sometimes aware of, sometimes, more often not, um, I think need to be addressed. And with that, I just want to emphasize that no brokerage is perfect. We aren't saying that Redfin as a brokerage is any better on this issue than another brokerage. We're all working to get better. Every brokerage is filled with well-meaning people, but still, uh, there are all sorts of ways that we fall short of the ideals that got us into this business in the first place, which is to help people get into homes. So. I think that your research was really sensitive to all the different ways that real estate agents are trying to do their jobs mm -hmm. and all the ways that results in consequences that are really hard for society. So I just wanted to thank you for doing the research. Thank you for making the trip out here. This was a fantastic conversation. We're ready now for our agent panel, but thank you, Professor thank you Corbett. For Actually, we are going to take a quick 15 minute break. So for those of you that are on the live stream, we'll be back in 15. Oh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> thanks. for coming back. Everyone on live stream, hello. So we're going to move into the segment where we will have some testimony from some of our Seattle agents. And as with the uh, last segment, you will have an opportunity to ask some questions. So we have James, Lori, and Rod. Okay, James, would you like to introduce yourself? Yep, uh, my name is James Lee, uh, originally from England. I joined Redfin three years ago and um, uh, on the Bellevue Mercer Island team, and um, never looked back since. <laughs> um, my name is Lori Bakken, and I work in the South King County area. Um, I'm almost at nine years at Redfin, so a little bit of time. <laughs> and Rod? Uh, my name is Rod Story. Um, I joined Redfin not too long ago, about four months ago. Um, I've been an agent for about two years. Um, and living in Seattle for a while now, a uh, while now, and I just welcomed my first daughter into the world. Congratulations. Oh. Thank you. Congratulations. So, James, okay. <laughs> yes. since you're closest to me, okay. yeah. sorry about that. <laughs> Can you tell me um, how you feel your upbringing um, has affected your views on culture? Ooh, okay, straight in there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting one. Uh, maybe it's a good example of how education uh, can uh, be a reason uh, why there is prejudices uh, or lack of it. Um, so I uh, grew up pretty confused <laughs> because uh, it was a very juxtaposed up upbringing. Uh, immigrant, first generation immigrant family in England, uh, very traditional Chinese upbringing in the household, but outside of it, it was 99.9% .9 white community as a you know, very small town, um, and so very British. So you have this juxtaposition. And, and uh, wanting to find out about my heritage um, back in the days before the internet, which I'm showing my age now, um, all we had, and I remember very vividly, was an encyclopedia uh, in the local library with three paragraphs summarizing uh, the history of China and its culture. So all of my understanding of my own heritage was from these three paragraphs. Um, fast forward. 10-ish years, and I get to go on my first trip to China, and um, you know I'm expecting this ancient noble culture that uh, uh, you know created paper and fireworks and all that. Um, and actually, I was a little surprised. You know, the first, as soon as we got on there, you know people were jumping in queues and everything like that, and uh, I did, you know, just didn't match up with kind of my expectation uh, because that was all I had to go on. So I actually left that trip a little bit demoralized in that, um, you know, you know wh why were people kind of a little bit rude, in fact? And this was, again, quite a few years ago, and China's made you know, huge headway since. Um, and 
after coming back, you know, I studied a little bit more about the history of, uh, of the country and realized that they ha you know, the country and its people have been through these you know, quite big horrors, really, with uh, the war uh, and a civil war going on simultaneously, followed by a cultural revolution. Um, and it kind of came to me to, to realize that, uh, you know, when you are in that position, I mean, it's very easy to judge people and queue up and have manners when, you're, when you have a full belly. Um, but, um, you know, if you are in a position where, you know, you have to fight for food for your family, like if you queue up, your family's basically gonna go hungry, I'm not gonna queue up. I'm gonna be in there as well trying to, trying to fight for food and things like that. So um, I think when you come from, and this is the still, still the same generation, you know, so when you're brought up in that, I think, um, you know, it really kind of changes your perspective, and it's very easy for me to judge, you know, coming from, you know, uh, you know a place where you, your belly is full and, you know, you're all happy. Um, so, uh, you know, you really kind of takes you to a place where you have to understand where people come from before you make any judgments, uh, you know, down to the old adage of, you know, don't judge a person until you've kind of, like, walked in their shoes. Um, so I think that was the first kind of epiphany for me to realize that, you know, um, not to just judge people from my own to, like, perspective and actually to uh, keep an open mind and find out where people are from before you judge them. And how has that influenced you as an agent with Redfin? Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, obviously coming in from that, I mean, that opened the door um, and from then on, uh, I, you know, I had a kind of quite a big interest in, you know, meeting all sorts of people and just kind of, it's just interesting to me, you know, uh, you know why people do this, you know, what, what kind of changed their behavior. And that's actually come in line very much with um, the strategy that Redfin now is trying to use, where we actually are encouraged to find out really the root of what's kind of encouraging people uh, to, well, in this specific case, buy, buy a house, but, you know, just to get to know, to know people in depth uh, more before you make the judgments. It's so easy to just go in and say, hey, uh, uh, how much do you want to spend on a house? You know, but it's actually better to kind of uh, understand them and their background first before you make any decisions. Right. So, right. yeah, it kind of fell, fell in line perfectly. That's great. Thank you, James. No problem. Glory, can you tell me what do you think Redfin could be doing better as a company with the policies and procedures that we have to serve people of color? Um, well, I think right here, being in this room, having this discussion is huge. I, I can guarantee you there's probably a, not a lot of other real estate companies even taking this topic on in this room and in a meeting situation. Um, I, For me personally, I had a couple experiences uh, just actually in the past six months where my manager was aware that I spoke Spanish. For me, Spanish was my first language. I grew up in South America, and I had never really had that opportunity to do anything in Spanish. And my manager knew that I spoke Spanish and contacted me because a support agent received a phone call from uh, somebody looking to sell their house, and they wanted a Spanish-speaking agent. They wanted to feel uh, comfortable with them. And they called upon me, and I was, I was like super excited. I just hadn't had that opportunity. And uh, I, I met with these folks, and um, it, it turned out great. They wrote their, their survey in Spanish, and I was just all excited. And it really made me uh, gain some more perspective. But actually, so I think having the managers be aware that you know, what you have on your team, any diversity, anything that could help um, make people feel comfortable, I, th I think the language of real estate itself uh, doesn't matter what what you speak, but real estate itself is so foreign to so many buyers and sellers. It's just not something you do all the time. So being able to have that connection, um, I think I think helps. Um, education wise, uh, I think we're such a diverse group, and and within our own hiring practices, I think it's it's good, of course, to. Uh, venture out that way. And maybe it's not that somebody's fluent in a certain language. Maybe it's a young person that's getting started in real estate that uh, maybe has done a lot of traveling and they understand different cultures or different um, countries they've been in. And just helping people feel uh, comfortable that way with their um, 
home buying or home selling experience. I mean, everybody wants, everybody pretty much wants, I, that's what I was so surprised about when I called upon these folks that wanted to sell their house. I kept thinking, well, what will be different? And actually, it really wasn't. They wanted the same thing everybody else did, and that's to sell your house for the most amount of money in the quickest amount of time. And, but, they were so scared that they would check mark the wrong box or if they got to escrow, they would not answer the question right and they would have all their money withheld from them. It just, it seemed like an irrational fear, but I, I really could understand that. Um, because people that don't have those challenges have those fears as well. So I think just, we, we continue to have such great transparency at Redfin and, and being able to assist people, that, that becomes big. Yeah. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lori. Rod, how about you? Um, can you share a time where you've experienced uh, issues with race, say, in the workplace? Um, yeah, so I was, before joining Redfin, I was a traditional agent. Um, and we had a shared workspace at the office I was in. Um, there was no particular dress code or anything like that. Uh, people came in pretty casual. Um, and there was a senior agent in the office uh, who I would regularly kind of ask questions to, uh, get advice from. He kind of, you know, talked to a lot of people in that, in that capacity. Um, and, you know, a few times, you know, sometimes I would, I would show up wearing a hoodie, um, you know, kind of going off what my peers would do, you know, hoodie um, or, or jeans and, and a sweatshirt, stuff like that, kind of what I, took in from my peers to be, to be typical and acceptable. Um, and there are a few times, you know, he, he had made a comment, um, you know, like, do you think that, that you're ready, that you look ready to sell a million dollar home? And, you know, that kind of sat with me, you know, made me take a second to, to think about it and say, well, maybe he's right, but then, you know, kind of that, based on experiences I've had in the past, made me think maybe there's something, something else going on there. Um, you know, just because in, in relation to, to my peers who would wear yoga pants and a sweatshirt or, you know, I, I felt that I was dressed uh, appropriate based on the guidelines to the office. Um, this happened a few times. Um, and then, you know, I, I never really gave it, gave it the time of day or anything. I would just kind of take it and, and go on. Um, but one day came and, and I had plenty of time. And, uh, you know, he kind of kind of approached me in the same the same manner. Um, and I asked, you know, is this is this a racial thing? You know, is this something that maybe you expect more of me because of of my race? Um, and he had a comment that just just kind of sat with me oddly. And he responded. He said, if anything, I would expect less of you. Wow. And I was, you know, I, yeah, naturally, I was just kind of taken aback. Um, and, and just kind of had to sit and think with, think with that for a second. I removed myself from the situation, which I think was best. Um, but yeah, and I mean, you know, I, I avoided uh, interaction with that agent uh, kind of moving forward. I never really addressed it directly uh, with him because, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of one of, those, one of those issues. But yeah, that definitely was something uh, kind of from an internal mm -hmm. uh, a thing within the industry that, that really stuck with me. So. Wow, that's interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Lori, James, do you have any additional commentary or maybe additional? Well, I, I've always thought since I, I was lucky enough to just have these few opportunities and, and venture into something new is what else could I do as an agent to try and reach out? If I could help these people, of course, they, they were happy and they were going to tell their friends and, and would result in, in being able to do more business in a different language. But I started thinking about what else could I do? Um, could I do, I love to do home buying classes. And I thought I could do a home buying class in, in Spanish. I'd love to do that. So, um, you know, I think that's one of the things Redfin can do. A lot of times, uh, like I saw that we marched in the Gay Pride Parade, but maybe we as a company can, around Seafair time, there's always different festivals, this heritage or that. 
we should be we should be prominent in all areas, not just one single parade, but let's let's be in different areas, uh, things like that. I'd love to see us work on. Yeah. Fantastic. James, how about you? Oh, well, I appreciate already that this dialogue has even been started. So thank you, Glenn, for, you know, for, for being able to bring this up. And, um, but, uh, you know, and I already think that it's beginning. Uh, the, you know, the internet is already you know, a, a fantastic tool um, you know, to, to be able to start uh, taking away any prejudices because now anyone has access to any of us. If you know, anyone wants to work with any of us, they can just kind of have a direct line in, you know, uh, straight with the internet and, 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 and vice versa. So that, it, you know, I think the, the world in a, in, a, in a way is already kind of coming together with that. Um, they, you know, we still have to remember the personal aspect uh, of it and, and treat individuals as individuals. Um, uh, I think corporately, you know, I hope that everyone will be, you know, starting to turn, take these steps um, and educate people. Um, but I, I'm wondering if perhaps that we should be more of a, a push legally, um, because you know, uh, I think there is from what we can do individually as a business compared to the impact that can happen with things like the, the Fair Housing Act. Um, if we could, as a, as a, as a body, lobby the, uh, the government to kind of uh, add um, laws which would do this, I think they would have probably a, a better impact. And it would be a level playing ground as, as opposed to one company doing it and not another company doing it. So, you know, perhaps there's uh, still different angles, you know, um, to, in, or, in order to push this forward. Thank you. And Rod, how about you? After having experienced something like that within the workplace, how did that mold you or change you? Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's something that uh, growing up in the South, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very used to a kind of overt uh, prejudice. And coming here and seeing that the prejudice in some areas is much more implied almost or implicit um, is kind of definitely definitely a varying view um, so it's it's kind of one of those things and I mean I think it was mentioned earlier you know what kind of how how Redfin agents can can talk to or address people of color um, and so I really wouldn't point out one specific anecdote or something that people to reference uh, when working with with agents uh, with customers of color um, I think more importantly, I would I would stress awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, as as humans, uh, we kind of are our actions are driven uh, mostly by subconscious bias uh, and predetermination. So I think being aware of that, mm -hmm. admitting that to oneself, um, seeing how that affects other people, how it affects your behavior, uh, and educating yourself on on how to to prevent that and change your behavior. Um, I think would be a step in the right direction to providing quality customer service. So, okay. Fantastic. I'm going to move on now to see if there's any questions or comments or suggestions from anyone in the audience. Okay, if we have one back here. Um, thanks for doing this. It's, as agents, it's really great to see you guys get up there. Um, the question I have is, uh, particularly towards customers dealing with kind of unconscious biases they might have towards either yourself as an agent of color or towards neighborhoods that might be, uh, you know, not primarily white or even just more mixed uh, of different races. How do you guys deal with kind of breaking up those biases without, you know, worrying about offending the, the client or, or kind of just calling it out bluntly? Yeah. Um, I think, if you don't mind, um, I think one one way to to address that is to use statistics. Kind of kind of as Glenn Corver pointed out for us, those biases and stereotypes are kind of based on fallacy. Uh, there's not too much evidence to actually provide weight to that. Um, so I think coming prepared with um, you know statistics, they can kind of show. Uh, that the way the way neighborhoods are are set um, and what what's actually going on in the neighborhood uh, could be could be a big step in, in tearing that apart. 
James, were you going to answer that? No, I, I agree 100% um, with both, actually, um, where you know, the, the, the figures, um, essentially what you want to do is you, you don't want to be making a decision for people. You want to be providing them with the information to make a decision. Um, so uh, you know, I think that that's one of the better ways to, you know, to be able to take yourself out of uh, any prejudices that you might have is to provide them with the information and knowledge um, to yeah. be able to make a decision. Exactly. Okay. Do we have another question? Oh, we have one back. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> oh, is that Glenn? It's going to be a biggie. That's not allowed. <laughs> question. I, I wanted to ask you how you handle cultural collisions between a buyer and a seller when you have a buyer that has one set of cultural expectations around, say, negotiations, where the buyer comes from a culture of bargaining or negotiation, and then the seller becomes affronted by that or offended by that. Um, you know, some of the situations that I see here in Seattle are about customers wondering whether the agent is really on their side because the customer really comes from a culture of wanting to negotiate aggressively, but the agent feels caught in between that buyer and the seller and, and how the seller will react to that. And I just wonder how you establish your credibility with the customer we're supposed to be representing, but also guide them to the result that they ultimately want. Um, I mean, I've, I've had uh, experiences such as that to where, you know, I meet a client um, and they're asking all kinds of different questions uh, about based on the culture that they, they're from and they're involved in uh, that I kind of was unaware of. And, you know, I, I can't speak for everyone, but the way that I addressed it was just kind of plainly. Um, you know, I let them know that I, I did lack education about their culture. Um, and kind of opened up that dialogue with them to, to kind of get more information and see, and then as well as providing, um, you know, what information I could from the real estate side of it. So trying to open that conversation um, and just kind of, again, being aware of, of sometimes your, your own ignorance can, can really help uh, mitigate those situations. I'd like to answer that question too. Um, one of the things that I try to do with my buyers when I am aware that they do want to have the back and forth negotiating, I have that with them first before I even get to the listing agent and their seller. So that way it kind of minimizes the amount of back and forth that we have. Um, I also like the fact that Redfin does have so many um, statistics and data that I can provide to them to try to get them to understand that, yes, I understand you want a good deal, but you know we have data that backs up the fact that this house should go in this range. Um, and let them know that I'm an advocate for you and I'm going to try, I understand that you want to buy a house for a certain amount and I'm going to try my best to get that, um, that particular price, but let's put it you know, in this range. And by, by being able to show them that data, I can eliminate a lot of the back and forth. And then sometimes too, it's an education to the listing agent where I tell them, you know, please don't consider this a low ball. I've had, you know, great conversation with my buyer and, and this is the direction we're going. I'm going to submit an offer for this amount. And um, that way it, it kind of lets them know ahead of time, we might have a little bit of back and forth. They won't consider me as a problem, um, but understand that that is the buyer that I'm representing and this is how we're going to handle this negotiation. So, I'd like to add to that too, actually. Um, I, I always think that is a, a, a nice perspective for people. If you tell them to put, going back to the shoes thing, I guess I have an obsession with shoes, but uh, um, you know, as a buyer who is if, if trying to ag aggressively negotiate, I'll say, okay, well, you know, imagine if you are the seller, you've got this beautiful home that you've put in 10 years to make it, you know, and, and someone's coming in very aggressively, you know, how would you feel? Um, and then vice versa, you know, when, when I approach the, the listing agent uh, who, you know, who, you know, if I'm going, I'm saying, look, hey, we're all, all on the same team and, you know, we have a buyer here and, you know, imagine yourself as a buyer, you obviously want to try and get you know, the best deal. So please don't take it the wrong way. So I always try to flip it with everyone. Uh, so, okay, if you're the buyer, imagine you're the seller. If you're the seller, you imagine, you know, and uh, just to make sure, uh, make sure that everyone understands that we're all on the same team. The buyer wants to, you know, to, to buy the house, the seller wants to sell your house, you know, we're all on the same team right. really. So, um, you know, I think that perspective thing uh, and flipping it around all the time actually is a huge benefit to everyone. That's great, thank you. 
we have any other questions? We have time for another two? Yes. Hi. Um, oh, wait. Hi. Let's get a mic for you. Um, I would love to hear more about what a bigger entity, like what a red fin or a brokerage or a national association of realtors or another trade association could do for you as agents for buyers and sellers to help with all these issues that you're coming across. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, again, uh, awareness and, and education. I think providing um, some background education and some upfront education as well, kind of making people aware of of our, our unconscious bias and as well as, you know, um, other cultures that we'll be dealing with. A lot of people don't get to experience other cultures. So once they come across that, it can cause it can cause some some unexpected problems. So I think um, kind of heading that off with more education uh, culturally and kind of kind of leading leading the talks uh, with opening that awareness, I think would, would definitely help uh, address that a little better. We um, had some unconscious bias training here at Redfin, and I, I was kind of thinking, oh, you know, it's one of those things, what do I need to do, just go through it. But for me, it was huge, it was eye-opening. I really, it, it, it made me like look deep inside and what do I think, and, and, it, and it was specific training that really helped uh, me to understand that. So I, I do think that would be, it should, be right up there with any of the realtor courses that yeah. you know are mandated should be this unconscious bias. It would be hugely helpful, I think, sure. as a whole in the industry. For sure. We have time for one more question. I'll ask one more. <laughs> <laughs> My other question is, how how do you deal with a situation where you have a customer? that's not from your particular racial background, ethnic background, sexual orientation, or what have you, and you want to win their trust. If you're a white agent in this audience who is thinking, oh, well, I need to work on how good I am at advocating for Asian American customers or for African American customers or something like that, just do you have any advice about how you approach that to make sure that folks understand you're on their side and that you understand them? I'm going to try not to use a shoe analogy. Uh, so uh, I think probably um, it should come from yourself in that uh, as, as a person, you should love people you know, you should, and, and, uh, and have empathy. So if you're going out, um, you should genuinely just be kind of caring for the person going, oh, you know, and if you don't understand, to ask the questions, why? You know, hey, so why, why is it that you have this thing against you know, uh, a house facing east or whatever, whatever it is? Um, and just you know, asking questions, being empathetic, and trying to understand where they're coming from, and you know, uh, have an open mind and accept that. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna. Okay. I'll move one of the chairs. So next, um, we are gonna hear from Carlos and Ellen. Okay. So Ellen, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Ellen Campion, and I've been with Redfin a little over three years. Um, lived in the Middle East for many years as well, so worked with so many ethnicities. I honestly, I could not possibly count them, and uh, um, but uh, really enjoy Redfin. Thank so. you, and Carlos. Uh, my name is Carlos Mojica. I uh, am married, have two children, a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old. I, uh, you can probably tell from my accent, I am not from this area. I grew up in the city of Boston. I just recently retired from the FBI last December. I served in the FBI for 20 and a half years. Uh, my most recent position with the FBI was the assistant special agent in charge. So I was number two in command for the state of Washington. And I actually want to thank some of my co-workers who actually just made it in. Uh, so thank you very much for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. 
Thank you. So we're moving into the segment now where Carlos is a customer of Redfin and Ellen being his agent. So we'll, we'll have, again, an opportunity to have Q&A after the fact, but we do have some questions for you too now. Okay. So Ellen, um, what would you say you've done in your career to help prepare you for working with customers of different cultures? Well, Saudi Arabia was probably the, <laughs> the, the, the biggest education because um, nobody was from here. I mean, everybody was from somewhere else, some other country, um, different color, different, different customs, um, different religions, um, pretty much. <laughs> It, it, it was pretty wild. It was it was great though. Um, uh, a girl from that was uh, born and raised in uh, Parkland, Washington, a little tiny town, um, never went anywhere in her entire life to end up in Saudi Arabia was uh, pretty phenomenal. And I and I and I am extremely grateful mm -hmm. for the um, the privilege of being able to do that. Um, so how did that prepare me for? Um, working, frankly, in this, um, uh, the climate that we have now, is that, you know, treating people with love and compassion, regardless of color, creed, religion, gender, whatever, um, it's, just, it's just how I run my life, uh, personally and professionally. So I, uh, I, I think that my, my entire life ha prepared me for that. You know, I come from a blue collar family, very much wrong side of the tracks. So I understand uh, uh, maybe some prejudice in a little bit of a different way, um, uh, maybe an economic kind of a thing. So um, as I said, treating people with kindness and compassion mm -hmm. and how I would want to be treated myself, um, those are the things that my life experiences have taught me. Okay, thank you, mm -hmm. thank you. And Carlos, can you share, since you were in the FBI, um, just your views on diversity and how things varied from different neighborhood to neighborhood or even just, you said, from Boston versus here in Washington, yeah. what different levels of diversity? Well, one of the things in the FBI that we always tried to do is tried to get the, uh, kind of mirror the, the communities that we were serving. So we tried, we were very aggressive with regards to our recruiting efforts. Uh, we, I personally went to ser several different neighborhoods to try and talk to the folks, educate the community on what we do and uh, make them feel comfortable coming to us with information and so forth. Uh, uh, working together to solve crimes, that kind of thing. I, as I mentioned, I grew up in Boston. Um, the area where I lived in Boston was not uh, considered one of the best areas in, in the city. Um, so growing up, I knew, and again, I, having grown up in Boston as a little kid, I was exposed to a lot of different things. In Boston, back when I was growing up, there was this thing called forced busing, where kids from uh, mostly minority communities were forced, you know, would, would go to um, mostly white neighborhoods to receive an education, you know, grammar school, middle school, and high school, and so forth. Uh, I remember as a little kid seeing images of, you know, buses, you know, with little kids with bottles being thrown, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So I knew, even as a little kid, that there was certain neighborhoods that they weren't gonna be as welcoming to me just because of the way I look. I am of Puerto Rican descent. Mm -hmm. um, much like you growing up in my house, we only spoke Spanish um, because that's my, what my parents insisted, uh, although they knew how to speak English, obviously. Um, they insisted, it, it, well, while my sisters and I have three sisters that at home, we, we, we always speak Spanish. Obviously, we ate all Puerto Rican food. We, were immersed in the Puerto Rican culture. Um, my family would send me to Puerto Rico as I was growing up during the school vacations, so I would be more, even more so immersed in the Puerto Rican culture while in Puerto Rico on vacation. So um, for me, you know, oh, I should also mention my wife is African American. 
Um, so when, you know, we had a conversation just recently, when we were looking for neighborhoods and places to live, I wanted to make sure that I found a location that where I felt my wife and my kids and I would feel comfortable. And so, you know, I look, I, I do look at some of the information that is on the internet and in particular, some of the, the information that's listed with certain real estate companies when it comes to schools. Mm -hmm. And I will look to see exactly how diverse the schools are for that particular community. Because for me and my wife, it's important for us that our children grow up in a diverse community. And so, and, you know, aside from that, obviously, there's other research I would do because of my background. I want to find out what the crime rate is. I want to find out if there's sexual offenders living in that neighborhood. So there's, you know, we'll do our own research aside from whatever research is listed on the, on the internet as well. So to transition, and thank you for that. So Ellen, what type of support did you give Carlos? Um, well, I just, basically I did my job like I do with every other, right. <laughs> every other <laughs> seller. Um, uh, presented offers as I came in and, uh, um, you know, negotiated uh, um, for obviously getting the most amount of money right. in the least amount of time. <laughs> uh, that, that's always the goal. Um, but, uh, you know, other than that, uh, I, I really, um, I, I did my job. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I like to think that um, uh, you establish a connection with people and, uh, uh, so that you can uh, kind of meet them where they live, if you will, um, uh, in, in order to be best serve them. But, uh, you know, a real estate transaction is a business transaction, and you, you have to present, uh, literally, you have to present whatever offer you get, whether you think it's crazy or not. Um, <laughs> Speaking of lowball, but uh, but you know you, you just do that and uh, and of course educating your seller um, uh, once in a while uh, you know I, I, I don't this did not happen you know with Carlos but uh, and Tanisha but uh, you, you do get the that culture that that likes to bargain and you just say hey you know it's it's, it's a bargaining thing too so nobody can be offended it's just part of how they they do things, and uh, there's no offense needed to be taken here. And so that's just kind of how I approach it. I'm really practical uh, when it comes to my business, um, when it comes to people, right. and, and I always treat them, like I said before, um, as I would wish to be treated. Right, thank you. And so, Carlos, did you get a lot of support from your She was agent? absolutely <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 our overall experience with Redfin was fantastic. Um, everyone treated us with respect. Uh, they were polite. They were courteous. I mean, they were professional. So I was very thankful. And one of the things you know uh, we looked for when we first met with Ellen was she mentioned you know she talked to us about the fact that she had lived overseas and that her husband was in the service. I had been in the service as well prior to you know many years prior to joining the FBI, so, um, you know, we had something in common. Okay. Um, one of the questions that, you know, we talked about previously, actually, during the phone call was, uh, which I thought was an interesting question, uh, would I feel more comfortable if there was a, a person of color within the team, within the Redfin team, not just the listing agent, but the photographer or the person that came in to do the staging? My honest answer is yes. I think because uh, automatically, I would feel I would have something in common. Mm -hmm. In this case, we overcame that because she mentioned that her husband, she had lived overseas and she, you know, her husband was in a service and so, you know, we clicked right then and there. Um, because, you know, that's, you know, as a, a seller, I'm looking, you know, I'm hoping that she's gonna understand my, or whoever's gonna sell my house is gonna understand my perspective and, mm -hmm. and look, you know, look, look after, you know, my, and my wife's, uh, you know, how do I put this? Your interest. My interest, right. exactly. You know, and because of my profession, you know, I had moved. You know, I started in, uh, 
as I mentioned, I was in Boston, and when I joined the FBI, eventually went to uh, Virginia, later went to New York City, then the DC area, and then ended up here in Seattle. So we have been through the, you know, selling and buying homes, you know, quite a bit, that's, so. That's fantastic. Thank you. Now, um, we had a conversation not too long ago, yep. and you were giving us a story about an experience that you had when you had moved into your new home. Can you share yep. that with the audience? Yep, uh, we moved, uh, the city where I live is quite diverse. It just so happens the neighborhood where we happen to buy the house, it's got a great view, that's why we bought the house. Uh, and uh, our neighborhood, like I said, the city is very diverse, but our, the neighborhood where we currently live is not quite as diverse. And so we purchased the house and about three weeks after, maybe, maybe a month after, I'm gonna get my mail and I hear somebody yelling at me. Hey, what are you doing there? And I said, well, I'm getting my mail. So she runs out of her house and approaches me and says, well, you don't look like anybody that lives here. What are you doing? What are you doing there? I said, I'm getting my mail. And she said, well, I'm going to call the police. And I said, please do. And so uh, she didn't. But what she did do is she followed me to my house and eventually actually walked up my property because I live, my property is up, uh, uh, it's kind of a steep driveway. So she walked in my driveway, walked all the way up to the base of my stairs because she wanted to see me put my key in the door because she wanted to make sure that it was actually my house. Wow. So I was thinking, okay, you know, a few days passed and I went to speak to the neighbors that lived directly in front of me. It's a young couple, white couple in the late 20s. I explained what happened and I said, look, I don't want to read too much into this. Is it because she's concerned about the neighborhood or do you think perhaps she's got racist tendencies? Mm -hmm. And they both without a beat said, no, no, she's racist. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, at least now I know. Yeah, yeah now Sweet. I know. And so, um, but since that, since that time, you know, we have seen her, and I'll nod because, you know, I'm going to always be polite. Right. Uh, anyway, fast forward from that point, three or four months later, my wife and I, are, you know, we were visiting friends because previously lived in the Brownsport section at Tacoma. We came home and we pull up in our driveway and there's commotion going on in, in, in the lady's home and there's a lady on the floor. My wife happens to be a nurse practitioner. So she goes to the area, she, we knew it was our house because obviously it was two houses away from ours and she was laid out on the floor. Apparently she got drunk and she fell on the floor. Oh. And so my wife did the right thing, and she, because she's trained in first aid, mm -hmm. because like I said, she's a nurse practitioner, she rendered care. But, wow. anyway. Wow. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, that yeah. is. That is, wow, yeah. wow. That's oh, oh, and uh, <laughs> to finish the story off, to finish the story <laughs> off, uh, a couple of days after that, she comes and she knocks on, the, the uh, young white couple's door, and she said, hey, that guy claims to be in the FBI. And our neighbor tells her, who's very sweet, right after we moved, she had come over, she introduced herself, her husband came over, introduced herself, and so we had already a relationship, and she said, yeah, that's because he's the second in, in charge of the FBI for the state of Washington. Wow. So he is in the FBI. He wasn't lying to you, you know. Right. So did you notice? But I, I did. Uh, one part that I also forgot to mention was I tried to tell her I was a law enforcement officer. I didn't say I worked for the FBI, but I did try to tell her I'm a law enforcement officer. But clearly, she didn't believe me. Wow. And what's your relationship now with that neighbor? Well, no, we just I'm like I, you know, we will nod. She hasn't baked any pies and brought them to the house. <laughs> but you know. We'll nod to each other, and like I said, and if she needs anything, you know, we're still gonna. Right. Wow. You right. Know. And how long have you lived there? Uh, a little over a year now. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Oh. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Yeah. 
going to open it up to questions in the audience. Does anyone have any questions for Ellen or for Carlos? Glenn? <laughs> So, Carlos, um, one of the things, Redfin, uh, I think James Lee mentioned this in, in the last segment, where we have agent profiles on the website and that people can choose that. But more, how did you decide, or did you decide, uh, whether to work with Alan? How did that, how did you guys first meet? Was it something where it was just the website and you were like, oh, who's this person? Or did you have some... A decision about, oh, actually, this is a person I, you looked at, whatever her stats may have been on the profile, et cetera. I actually saw a Redfin commercial. Okay. I went Great. to the website, I found the number, I called the number, and then I got in contact with, uh, she called me. <laughs> That's essentially how we met. And, and follow up question. So she called you. One, could you, did you know, okay, this person is either like me or not like me or seems to know what she's talking about? Like, how much in your head were you thinking, like, no, she's got to try out and come into my living room and earn my business? Or was it like, actually, when you had a phone call, this person seems to know what she's talking about? Uh, there was a little both. She seemed, you know, obviously, I'm going to ask questions while I'm on the phone. And based on the responses, I'm going to invite her to my house. And so that's what happened. She answered the questions in a fashion that I liked. And then she came to my house and it worked out great for us. Great, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we have another question. Is there any information that you think was useful in finding a good neighborhood that wasn't available on the Redfin website when you were searching? Um, well, for me, it's some of the stuff that I, I, I found outside of the website, like for example, the sexual offender I wanted to find out if there were any sexual offenders in my area, you know, the area where I bought the home. Uh, and I wanted to find out about crime stats, crime statistics for that particular neighborhood and for the city as a whole. So I did not see those stats there. So I was obviously because of my job, uh, I was able to find them on my own. <laughs> but, um, uh, I, I should mention, uh, and we are part of the other thing, uh, you know, one of the other things that we discussed over the phone was, um, I think Helen, Ellen had mentioned that you weren't really aware of that this kind of, you know, thing, you know, racials, uh, uh, what, how did you put it? I can't remember, like, um, racial, uh, almost like, uh, attacks or that kind of thing actually happened in the state of Washington, right? Well, not in the state, I mean. Well, or in the area. Yeah. And so part of my responsibility, I was in, in charge of the criminal program, and within the criminal program, I was uh, in charge at, at, at that time of uh, hate crimes. Mm. So I had hate crimes, I had violent gangs, child prostitutions, all, 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 many different areas. Um, and so I was aware keenly aware that there's certain areas around the state where those kinds of things yeah. do happen, where people have things spray painted on their garage door, mm -hmm. where people are refused to, you know, to be served in certain establishments because of the way they look. So for me, like that's one of the reasons why my wife and I, when we were looking, we wanted to make sure that we found some, some, a place mm -hmm. that's somewhat diverse that makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Oh, we have another question. Thanks for coming in today, Carlos. Thanks for having me. Um, we are trying to build a diverse technology team and company at Redfin. Could you tell us a little bit more about when you were at the FBI, how you hired a diverse workforce? Like, what kind of things did you do to get diversity? Well, we went to many different job fairs at college and universities. We went to military bases. JBLM was a big one for us. Um, we, I, I went to several different, even high schools, because we knew eventually those kids are high school age now, eventually they're going to go to college, and eventually they're going to be looking for a job. So we educated the, the, every, the community, even community groups. I went to Tukwila and talked to, uh, and several of my coworkers did as well, 
to uh, a Somali community group that was there. I went to uh, Tacoma and, um, and I went to uh, Chehalis. I went to several different parts around the state to kind of educate people, not just on the special agent position with the FBI, but intel analysts and other professional support positions to plant a seed where hopefully, maybe they're not thinking about it now, but maybe five, 10 years from now, hey, I remember that one guy that came over to my school or to my community group. Maybe that's something I might want to consider, mm -hmm. so. And are you sharing with them what role they would play as far as if you're looking for you know diverse employees? Yes, that's one of the things I, I one of the things I stress. Uh, when I first came in the FBI 20 and a half years ago, now it's 21 and a half years ago because I've been retired for a while now. Um, the amount of ladies in the FBI, women, was not high. Uh, so even though, obviously, clearly I'm not a woman, when I would go out, I would explain, hey, this is why it's really important for us in the FBI to have more women in the FBI. We want people like the young ladies all, all, all the way in the back there. Uh, you know, when we explain to them, uh, these are the skills that we're looking for. We want folks who've worked in accounting. We want folks to, who are, have a legal experience, like, like my, one of my coworkers, Heather, back there. She has a, a JD, she's a lawyer. And Misty was in uh, the uh, service, she served in the Army. Jimmy Clement uh, has a, both a law degree and he served in the Navy. So, um, you know, explain to them, hey, this is, the, this is the kind of background that we're looking for and this is why I think it's important to have more women or more people of color in the FBI and, you know, encourage that back and forth and uh, hopefully convince one or two people in a crowd of 100 to eventually, uh, uh, you know, apply and make our, our agency better. The more, the way I've always looked at it, the more diverse we are, the better we're gonna be. That's right. right. Yeah. right. And the better we're gonna be able to serve the community that we should be serving. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah. Do we have- Well, I should also mention that after I retired, <laughs> I, I was lucky enough that the FBI actually hired me back through a consulting firm, so I retired. Two months late after I retired, I got hired by a consultant firm, and I work with. Uh, still, am lucky enough to work with the FBI once again, okay. but in a different role. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. Oh, we have one back there. Carlos, I'm curious. During your home buying process, when you're hunting for a home, did you ever have the perception that the race of yourself or your wife played a factor in any way? Perce even if it was perceived? Um, you know, I don't, you know, if, I never, you know, let me put it this way. Uh, there was one incident that we had where we went to uh, purchase the home, and at the time I was actually considering getting a VA loan. And so the person that was selling the home, it was in Des Moines, uh, told me basically that they weren't interested, well, through the realtor, that they weren't really interested in somebody, you know, selling the home through, through the, you know, a V, through the VA, basically. So my wife and I did think about it. Um, after the fact, we said, do you think it's really because of the VA or is it because of the way we look? So that thought did come through our mind, but the way we looked at it is, we eventually didn't get, go through the VA anyway, but the way we, my wife and I looked at it was, if they don't want our business, then we, you know, hopefully they sell the house for a hundred thousand less than they, we, than we would have purchased it for. You know what I mean? Because in the end, they kind of hurting themselves, right? Yeah. So. And there is a lot of prejudice against VA loans. There really is. I have to educate people all every day on. VA loans. Mm -hmm. Okay, sometimes sellers. It's, sometimes it's in the agent only remarks that they don't want VA loans. And it's not as if that's okay. Oh, sorry. It's not as if that's okay either. No. No. Um. no. Okay, so if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to thank the two of you for coming. Carlos, thank You're you welcome. so much thank you. for your time. Thank you so much. Very appreciated. So.
That concludes our event for today, um, live stream. Thank you so much for um, watching us. And for those here that are in uh, Seattle here at the headquarters, we're gonna have a networking event afterwards. So thank you. Thank you.